Is that better? All right. <laughs> but uh, in this uh, particular hymn, the background of the story is that there was a guy by the name of John Newton who wrote the song. And John Newton was a ship captain in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And he had a regular ship route that he took that went from England uh, to Africa to the Americas and then back. And he would keep doing this uh, route. The cargo that he carried on this route were slaves, human beings. He would go from England to Africa to pick them up. Then he would take them to the Americas. He would get goods there and bring it back to England. And that was his regular route. After a period of time, uh, we find that in some of his writings, he described the conditions and the treatment that these uh, slaves had on the journey. Many of them died. Many of them, uh, after they died, they had to throw the bodies overboard. Uh, they just simply did that. There were others that suffered through disease and all kinds of sickness on their way to the Americas. And many were lost even after they arrived there. It came a point in time in which John Newton was so convicted in his heart about what was being done because he saw the conditions uh, that these people were uh, living under on these voyages to America and then what was happening to them while they were there that he decided to completely quit the, the job. He left it completely. And he uh, came in contact with a pastor who helped to walk him through what he was sensing in his heart through the conviction that he was feeling. And he eventually gave his heart to the Lord. And after giving his heart to the Lord and reflecting upon his life, it was then that he wrote the words to the song that we know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. I, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Those words come from the perspective of someone who really understood what God's grace could do and what it was about. And as we look today at this feeding of the 5,000, this thing that was an absolute miracle, we see in it a number of ways in which Jesus was giving grace to people and how they receive that grace and how also he calls us at the same time to be givers of that same kind of grace. And so I want to read the passage this morning and then talk about some of these graces that God gives to us uh, that are so important. So in Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30, it has this to say. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And as Jeannie so uh, greatly uh, encouraged us with these words, this was the disciples coming back from their missions that Jesus sent them on earlier in chapter 6. And uh, they are coming back now to report after having been given Jesus' authority to drive out demons, to heal people, to preach the word. They're coming back and saying, this is what happened, uh, and giving a report on it. Then in verse 31, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, That would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much money on bread and give it to them to eat? Well, how many loaves do you have? He said, Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. 
And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And he also divided the two fish among them. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was about 5,000. Five graces that Jesus demonstrates here. Five graces that he wants to give to us. Five graces that he hopes that we might give to other people. And maybe you're here this morning and one of these graces, or maybe more than one of these graces, are graces that you need in your life right now. And also it may be possible that you know someone in your life that God is prompting you in your heart and saying you need to give those graces to whomever that person is right now. And I want you to think about that as we go through each of the graces this morning. The very first one that he has there is one that Jeannie alluded to. It is the gift of the grace of rest. Jesus gave and multiplied rest continually wherever he went. That was one of God's plans. He wants his people to be able to rest. These disciples had to be exhausted from the journey. I don't know if you've ever been on a missions trip uh, for a period of time, or maybe you've spent all summer at a camp somewhere uh, serving the Lord, or maybe you've gone on some sort of of journey where you were in service to the Lord for an extended period of time. And one of the things that happens when you do that, and what happened with these disciples, is they had to travel on foot for a lot of the time. Uh, they were continually doing the work of ministry while they were gone, and that can be exhausting. I mean, it, it, Jesus got exhausted physically. Whenever he was healing people and doing miracles throughout the day, uh, he had to have times of going to solitary places because he would get tired. And so he knew his disciples had to have been tired in these circumstances. He knew all of what it took to do what they had to do. And they had just returned from this. We're not told how long the journey was. It could have been several months that they were out on these missions that Jesus gave them. But they come back, and like many people who've been in the middle of a really cool ministry setting like that, you're on cloud nine. You're just like, this is what the Lord did here, and this is what he did over here, and all this happened, and these lives were changed, and they're so excited to tell about it. And at the same time, you're also kind of suffering from that jet lag and that tiredness that's there and the exhaustion from all the work that you've been doing. And Jesus read this on his disciples' faces. And he says, guys, I'm, I'm glad for all your stories. I'm liking what I'm hearing but let's take a moment to just rest. You guys need to come away with me and take some time to just rest. He was giving them that grace of rest in that moment. There are times that we are in need of that same kind of rest. And God knew this from the very beginning. It's very interesting to me that if you look at the Ten Commandments and you uh, read them all, and then you read the entirety of Scripture you will find that the most often mention of the Ten Commandments all throughout Scripture, Old Testament to New, is remember the Sabbath day. And yet for most of us, even as believers, it is probably the most violated of the Ten Commandments in our own personal lives. I mean, we as believers, we can be good about putting God first. We can be good about not worshiping idols. We can be good about obeying our parents and, and not murdering people and all of those kind of things. But we seem to think that remembering the Sabbath day is negotiable. That it wasn't something that God really meant. Or something that, that isn't for now. Because we're such busy people. You know, look at the way our culture has changed over several decades now. We used to have family businesses where the whole family worked together. And they spent their time together. And then during the manufacturing age... Uh, the fathers left the home to get jobs, and, and mom kind of took care of the household. And now we're in a day and age when both parents work because we have to do the same things uh, both of them do in order to have the same kind of lifestyle that they expected several years ago. And now we're getting into the place where parents work more than one job in some places and in some situations to get the same results that they got before. And we are working like crazy and God knows that we need the grace of rest. In fact, God gave a rhythm to the whole thing. It wasn't just one Sabbath day that he talked about during the week, uh, as we find in the Old Testament. It was also that there were Sabbath years. 
that every seventh year there was time to just kind of chill and relax. And then he had these festivals that they celebrated three times a year, which were like vacations. For a whole week, they did no work. They just stopped, and it was a Sabbath for a week. And God wanted to give his people rest, and he wants us to still be experiencing rest today. And yet, how often do we have to just keep going after whatever that next thing is that either we want or we have to have or we put on ourselves and we just keep going and going and going. And there's a lot of people who are exhausted. And they're out there every single day of the week and they are exhausted. And they just need the grace of some rest. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are the workaholic among us. Or maybe you're the person who's got all the schedules. And I mean, it's not just the jobs anymore. Our, our kids are full-time kids now. I don't know if you noticed, they used, used to be able to play and entertain themselves. I mean, I, I did that a lot when I was little. But now we've got entertainments everywhere, and we've got to do it all. And we've got to experience everything. And it leads to more exhaustion and more tiredness. And we need that grace of rest that Jesus wants to give. But maybe we're in the position on the other end of it. Maybe we're the boss. Or maybe we're people that are in charge of others and we have the ability for them to seek rest and have rest, resting in our hands. Are we giving it to them? Are we offering it to them? It's the grace of rest that we can give to them in any given moment. Jesus wanted to give that to his disciples. Well, then there's the grace of compassion. The grace of compassion it's very interesting, while they're going away to get apart from everything and to have these moments of rest, they take off on the boat and some people are kind of looking, oh, the boat's going in that direction, and they start gathering this crowd of people. Oh, he's going here, and they start to continue going. And I'm guessing someone must have made some homemade binoculars or something. Oh, they're headed this way, let's go over here. And they just kind of went and they gathered people as they went such that when they get to this remote place where they're supposed to be able to have rest, they show up, Jesus gets out of the boat, and there's a big crowd. I don't know about you, but if I had seen that in that particular situation, I would not have been as nice as Jesus. I would have said, y'all go home. Leave us alone. That's what would have been my first thought in that particular moment. But notice Jesus' reaction here. He gets out of the boat, he sees the crowds, and he says, I'm just moved with compassion. He had compassion for them. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He saw their brokenness. He saw their needs. He saw all of the things that were going on in their hearts and in their lives, and he was just simply moved with compassion. And it says he began to do what he always did. He taught them. He taught them many things. He gave more of himself. Even in this moment that he was ready to get rest, he just saw the people and he saw their needs and he knew in that moment they just needed the grace of compassion. They needed somebody who would sit with them. They needed somebody who would go through what they were going through with them. I remember the night of December 23rd, 2008, quite well. During that day, I had spent a good portion of my day, six hours or so, uh, at my other part-time job, apart from ministry, which was uh, delivering milk to restaurants and coffee shops and everywhere else. And, and it was one of those physically kind of exhausting jobs, uh, driving that uh, death trap of a truck that I drove around everywhere and then lifting the milk crates and doing all that kind of stuff. And then it could be mentally challenging some days uh, because there would be somebody in the kitchen or restaurant or wherever that just was having a bad mood uh, on that day. And you deal with all these different kinds of things. And and I went out there and did that during the day, and then I came back in the afternoon, and I started to prepare for a ministry that we had that was going. Uh, we called it a jam session. Jam session. It was Jesus and men, and we had this men's group that was meeting. And so I went and did some preparations for that event in the afternoon and got that all ready. And then we had the jam session at night and uh, had all the different things that went with that, and the discussion was good, and I can remember going home and saying, you know, these are the things that happened. This was kind of cool. I uh, wish more guys had shown up, that kind of thing. And then the phone rings. And it's 9 o'clock at night. And I remember on that phone was a gentleman who was a longtime member of the church, and he was holding back tears. 
And he said, she's gone. She's gone. I said to him, who's gone? He says, my wife is gone. She's passed away right here in our house. She was 68 years old. It wasn't normally thought of as being her time, but it was. I would be lying to you if there wasn't a thought probably in the back recesses of my mind somewhere that said, oh my goodness, now? But I knew in that moment that what was needed in that place, in that time, was compassion. I drove the 20 minutes across the city, got to the home. There was about 30 people there, this big Italian family. Italians do everything together. And I got there, and there was people that greeted me that had faces you could just tell were in shock. They were in grief. They were dealing with all the range of emotions that come with a sudden loss. I remember one of the granddaughters came to me, and she just hugged me, and she said, why did this happen? And I said to her, I don't know. I just kind of sat there with her, with the others, heard stories, all the great things that they could remember, sat with them in their grief, sat with them there as they tried to smile and as they tried to hold back tears, prayed over them, was there when the coroner arrived and they took the body out. And in that moment... And during those hours that were spent there, it was just a time to have compassion and be able to sit with people that were going through a very difficult moment. And it was such a privilege at the end of the night, about midnight, they all gathered around the dining room and they asked if I would just pray for them. And it was just a special moment to be able to say, Lord, these people are hurting. They're asking a lot of questions why that we don't have the answers to right now. They're going through just difficulty. And Lord, would you just be with them? Would you just bless them? Would you just give them what they're in need of right now? Those are moments when people need the grace of compassion in their lives. Even if it's been at the end of a long day, even if all this other stuff is going on around, we have to be able to see people the way Jesus saw them. As sometimes like sheep without a shepherd who need a comforter, who needs someone to come alongside and give the grace of compassion, as he did. Maybe you're that person who needs the compassion right now. Maybe there's things going on in your life that you just need somebody to sit with you through and be there for you. Maybe you're that person who's being prompted even now of someone you know in your life who just needs your time, who needs you to sit with them and needs that grace of compassion in this moment. Well, then there's the grace of patience. I know people don't like to talk about patience, and you certainly don't like to pray for it. But it's a grace. It is a grace and it's a gift that comes. And, and we see it here in Jesus because as it's getting later and later, as he's preaching and teaching on, the disciples are there, and, and it doesn't say this in the Word, but I'm just thinking this because human like them and all. I think that part of the reason that they're coming to him is not just because they need to eat and they need to, to feed this crowd. I think it's because we're supposed to have this time of rest and this is our time with Jesus. Send these people away. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure that had to be one of their thoughts uh, because I know Peter pretty well from what we read in Scripture and he's not a real patient person. And I'm sure that the other ones were a lot like him. And, and they were ready for their time and their little moment of rest. And so I'm sure they were looking for a way to send these people away so that they wouldn't have to deal with them. They wouldn't take away from the time of rest that they needed. And yet Jesus here again shows the grace of patience. He could have gone off on these disciples. I mean, he could have just said, don't you guys get it yet? And he could have said any number of things to them. But instead he just says, well, why don't you guys give them something to eat? Well, that would take more than a half a year's wages. And I can just hear the complaining that would be there. And again, Jesus is very patient. He says, just go look and see what you have. Just go find out where it is. And so they go and they find it out. And Jesus has this grace of patience with these 12 individuals who just don't seem to get it. I mean, they had gone on these missions. Jesus had given him his authority given it to them they were able to drive out demons and heal people and preach the word and do all these things 
and suddenly feeding people was a problem. And he had to be patient with them until they started to get it gradually and slowly, just understanding what Jesus could do and who they were with. And he showed that grace of patience continually. How many times have you gone to the Lord saying, Lord, we need this now. This needs to happen. Your prayers have been like that maybe a time or two. He said, Lord, this needs solving right now. Come and, and solve it. I know you can do it, and it needs to be done right now. This change needs to happen right now. This thing needs to be done right now. We are a right now kind of society and world. We want it all that. I mean, fast food has changed our lives completely. We just expect it to be done right now, our way, all of those kind of things. And we just don't have the patience. How many of you have gone through the drive through and were impatient at the other end of it because they got the order wrong after all that? You know? All right, one honest person here. Yes, very good. We need the grace of patience. I mean, if we really thought about all that the people in the restaurant are going through just to get out our food, I think we'd be a little more patient. If we understood what everybody else is, is going through in those moments when we want things right now, we'd probably be just a little bit more patient. Who do we need to exercise the grace of patience towards? Maybe you're the one who needs that grace of patience in your life. Well, then there's the grace of provision. The grace of provision in this moment. Jesus takes the bread and the fish. He looks up towards heaven. He probably recites uh, that prayer that was in the Mishnah that the Jews knew, which was, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us bread from the ground. And then he would have begun to break it up and put it into the baskets all there, and the baskets would have filled up, and, and miraculously it was all there. What I find interesting in this particular passage of Scripture is that nobody in the crowd that day who ate knew what had happened. It was only the, the disciples. They were the only ones on the inside that knew that all this came from five loaves and two fish. The crowd had no clue. They were simply provided for. The grace of multiplied provision was theirs, and they had no idea how much of a miracle it had been. How many of us can find ourselves in that place where we take things for granted that God has provided and we don't realize the grace that he has put into it. I mean, if we did a review of our lives and we did through all of our memories of everything that we've ever been given by God, I mean, we could pile lists upon lists that would probably fill this entire building just from one life. Because God has such grace in provision and providing for us that it is unbelievable. And how often do we thank him for that provision? How often do we take that grace of provision and try to meet the needs of others? Again, if we're to be like Jesus, we're supposed to offer that grace of provision to other people too. Sometimes we might be the answer to someone else's prayer, or we might be the person who is the hand and feet of God who brings that provision into another's life when they don't know where it's going to come from. We need people who will give the grace of provision as well as those who understand that they have received it from God. I mean, count the number of breaths that you take a day. I mean, it'd be quite a thing to try to think through that and actually count them during the course of a day. But we are told that every breath we have comes from God. Yep. That's part of his provision, just day after day. And he provides it without any kind of hesitation at all. How are we providing that grace of provision to other people? The last one, the grace of abundance. The grace of abundance. It wasn't enough for Jesus just to provide for the meal of those 15,000 or so that were actually there when you count the women and children. It was the fact that the disciples went out and found leftovers such that they filled 12 baskets full, which was going to provide for their needs for several days. Jesus was kind of showing off. And he was just saying, here is the grace of abundance. This is who I am. I don't give you just what you need. I'm going to give you beyond what you need. 
because I am a generous and gracious God. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced God's abundance. Sometimes he has given you more than what you could ever think or ask or imagine. And it has just overwhelmed you about his great grace of abundance because he just give when you didn't deserve it. And he calls on us in the same way to be those same kind of generous people who when we are giving grace to others that are in need to be able to say to them, you know what, I'm not going to give you just what you need. I'm going to give you more. Because I serve in a God who is, has the grace of abundance and I want to give the grace of abundance in your life too. Jesus here goes beyond and above and the disciples, again, they were the only ones that knew this. The people had no idea that were in that crowd that day. It was just for that inner circle of his followers who said, wow, this is an amazing God. He gives us in abundance. You know, and he's been the same all the time. This has been who God has been from the beginning, who he is today, who he will be tomorrow. And there's proof in the scriptures. I ran across something this last week that I thought was really cool. I want to share it with you. One of the most famous psalms that we have, that we know, that we've probably heard at funerals and other places is Psalm 23. I want to read to you parts of Psalm 23, and I want to do it in between parts of Mark chapter 6 that we've read here today. And why don't you see the abundant grace of God and how he multiplies it in so many different ways. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. He leads me beside quiet waters. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. He refreshes my soul. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. So he began teaching them many things. Even though I walk through the valley, dark, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How many loaves do you have? Go and see. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute among the people. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was about 5,000. God's grace and his multiplied grace has been the same, both in the past and in the present and will be in the future. So what of these five graces do you need today? Maybe you need the grace of rest in your life. Maybe you need the grace of compassion or the grace of provision, the grace of patience, the grace of abundance. What one do you know of people in your life today that you need to give? What grace can you offer to them that would change their life, allow you to look more like Jesus to them, that they might possibly become part of his kingdom? because of the grace that you extend that came from Jesus himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Your grace is greater than we can ever even ask or imagine. We thank you for giving us moments in our life and encouraging us to rest and giving us that grace. We thank you for the moments that you have given us the grace of compassion and have allowed us the opportunity to have compassion on others. 
We thank you for that grace of patience, that you are so patient with us. We thank you for the grace of provision that we haven't even noticed or seen in many occasions in our life. And we thank you for the grace of abundance that has blessed us beyond our wildest imagination. Lord, help us to be your servants, your reflection, by being those who offer these same graces to other people. We pray that you would enable us and encourage us in this effort. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen.